Hello and welcome everybody to this session on restoring our pastoral biodiversity. Uh, first of all, I'd um, like to thank the Oxford Real Farming Conference team for bringing us all together uh, and doing an amazing job over the, um, over the Christmas period in response to the emergencies we've been facing. Um, it's a tradition of the Pasture for Life movement that we start our, our meetings with just a short period of silence and perhaps we could just be quiet for a, a, a few seconds um, just to ground ourselves and to um, be grateful to Mother Nature. Thank you. Um, so welcome to Restoring Our Pastoral Biodiversity. And I may read things occasionally because I'm at the age, if I want to get to the end of a sentence, I have to write it down. So my name is uh, John Meadley, and I've been very much involved with this, um, developing this initiative around pastoral biodiversity. And we've called it Restoring Our Pastoral uh, Biodiversity um, because over 90% of our wildflower meadows have been lost. But um, what we'd have liked to have called it is celebrating our pastoral biodiversity because that's what we're going to do. And um, every fortnight for the last six months, one of our working farms, and I stress everything that you see here is from a working farm, every, um, we've um, celebrated and showcased um, biodiversity on a farm. And we've got three of them here uh, today. So we'll have stories from three uh, working farms that operate to pasture for life principles, um, together with observations from three people working in the academic uh, and scientific area. Um, throughout, you'll see the extraordinary contribution that the grazing ruminant, um, so often blamed by ill-informed media, uh, has been a major cause of global warming. You'll see what amazing contribution they can play in encouraging uh, pastoral biodiversity. As far as possible, we go straight, straight through the program. Um, we'll save questions to the end, um, unless there's something that clearly needs an answer. And questions, please, in the Q&A session, they're the only ones that we will be um, responding to. And we want you to leave this session uh, encouraged and enthused. Um, and there's a social group set up, should you want to follow up with any of the speakers or seek additional information. So I'm going to start now with a clip from um, just. Welcome to celebrating our pastoral diversity. If you wish to go fast, go alone. If you wish to go far, go together. That thoughtful proverb from Africa could be as applicable to farming as to humanity. Nature plans to go far and is not in a hurry. Nature is full of diversity and of relationships between soil, air, moisture, plants, animals, and microorganisms, as well as hosting a kaleidoscope of intercrossing genes. Since time immemorial, farmers have sought to work with nature, nudging, cajoling, and nurturing her through the natural cycles with different mixtures of plants and animals that together feed each other, feed mankind, and feed the soil. During the last 70 years, farmers have been pressured to move faster and smarter and to coerce nature to give up her fruits. During the Second World War, farmers were pressured to feed the nation, to plough up carbon-rich pastures, 
and apply artificial fertilizers. Globalization, the breakup of the marketing boards, and the lower prices demanded by the supermarkets have required farmers to get more from less. The natural synergy between crops, livestock, and soil has been lost on many farms. Monocropping has become common. Soils have become more acidic, carbon released into the atmosphere, and organic matter levels have fallen. Under pressure from so many sources, farmers have been forced to go faster and faster, such that the natural diversity of plants, animals and genes has been significantly diminished. We need to learn to slow down and to dance courteously with nature. Pasture covers two thirds of both UK and global farmland. It is the world's largest single solar panel. The soil under it is the largest single terrestrial store of carbon. Species rich grazed pasture can play a major role in helping us to slow down and to rebuild biodiversity. The gentle chewing of the cud, the transformation of otherwise indigestible cellulose into the meat and milk that feeds us and into the manure that feeds the life of the soil. The soil into which the roots of grazed grasses and herbs pump carbon from the atmosphere. We are launching this site to coincide with the inauguration of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystems Restoration, within which we wish to play our part. In the coming months, we will be demonstrating and celebrating the biodiversity of our pastoral farms. We wish to share what we know, to both learn and inspire. We will be welcoming, gentle, and have a sense of humor as we want this to be a joyful experience and to take everyone with us. We hope you will join us on the journey. I just quickly want to run through these farm pictures because these are farms that are, are not representative today. But this is FAO farms in near Oxford. The egrets have come back uh, only since they stopped um, feeding grain and went wholly pasture fed, kept the animals out all, all year round and the insect population grew. This is Whittington Lodge, Ian, uh, Ian and Cathy Boyd up on the Cotswolds. This amazing charm of goldfinches on chicory seeds um, here, this is um, a cat Frampton down on Dartmoor of these beautiful paintings that she makes of, of what she sees uh, and observes. And here's uh, a mushroom um, that, that she's picked up. Here's um, David and Wilma Finlay's farm up in Galloway, the cream of Galloway. Um, uh, they've got planted 35,000 broadleaf trees. They've identified 341 species identified on 340 hectares. Amazing. And there's another there that they've seen. And then this is Matt and Laura Elliott at Sandy Hill Farm. Uh, they're beautiful Herefords um, on this uh, lovely pasture. And uh, this last one just to remind us that it's not just about the animals and the pasture, but it's about the people. And that's Matt and Laura, who only started farming three years ago. Um, and th that's their, the farm. It just shows what's possible. Well, I'm going to stop um, sharing uh, my screen now, and I'm going to pass over to um, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Norton from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology. She's an agroecologist. Until recently, she managed the National um, Countryside Survey, and she just completed a three-year study, a uh, comprehensive review of the Pasture for Life system, which she designed and managed. And Lisa, can I pass the floor to you? Thank you. 
Yes, you can. Thanks very much, John. Uh, yeah, so as John says, I'm going to give a, a bit of a scientific perspective on this restoring our pastoral biodiversity. Um, so if I move on to my first slide, it just shows some pictures of farmland biodiversity, which John has already done uh, very beautifully. Um, uh, I wanted to focus particularly on the soil invertebrates, but uh, I, I see John has done that too. There's also a pond invertebrate there. Uh, and I suppose what I would say is that farmland biodiversity is about all these species, but it's also about the diversity of habitats that you get on farms. So including ponds and hedges and small copses uh, and areas that are perhaps a little bit less managed, but also about the diversity of enterprises so if you've got sheep and cattle maybe a little bit of horticulture a bit of um, arable as well that all provides diversity within a farmland system um, and, and why is diversity important uh, well this report from uh, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity said that it's becoming obvious that we urgently need to better understand what's happening to biodiversity because it uh, it will help us to manage ecosystem services effectively. So what you might ask are ecosystem services. Uh, so this little diagram on the right, kind of uh, all the vertical bars are ecosystem services. And you'll see that the big blue blob at the bottom says biodiversity. And biodiversity fundamentally underpins all ecosystem services. Uh, and there's production there. There's cultural service like aesthetic values or leisure. Uh, there's water quality, carbon storage, and uh, erosion regulation. So biodiversity is really important for fundamentally underpinning those things and some work says that in most cases intensive and profitable grassland production from semi-natural appears to be incompatible with maintaining a high level of biodiversity and that's because um, very often in, in, in many of our conventional systems at the moment, the biodiversity block that underpins services is being replaced by inputs and management, and that includes the drainage of the land, but also fertilizers, uh, in animal waste, particularly those which uh, include concentrated feed, uh, which are very high in phosphates, cutting, grazing. So management is, has been primarily focused on the one ecosystem service of production, the, the big red block, and much less so on those other ecosystem services. And that tends to be uh, the sort of, make it look like it's incompatible. Um, so just to jump back a little bit, these are figures from the countryside survey. Uh, it was last fully done in 2007, but is currently underway again, uh, I'm glad to say. But this, this, uh, these results just show us how much grassland we have. Um, acid grassland is not included here. So this is primarily our lowland uh, managed grassland. And you can see about 10% is, is neutral or semi-improved. About over 20% is improved. That's agriculturally improved. So ploughed and sown with rye grass very often. Uh, calcareous grass and a very small percentage. And that, as John says, results in a very small percentage of our grassland being considered species rich or semi-natural. And that grassland is concentrated in habitats such as those listed there. So um, countryside survey, again, I know it was a while ago, but uh, it, it, the next set of data will be coming soon. And what we found is that uh, it was actually started in 78. So we have decades of data, but they're showing a very negative trend in terms of species richness um, in, in neutral grassland patches. Uh, we saw a continuing negative uh, a decline basically in species richness over recent decades uh, and also highlighted some of the results on hedges because these are a really important landscape feature uh, particularly in pastoral systems uh, and we've seen that the managed length of managed hedges has been decreasing and that has been counterbalanced by an increase in lines of trees and you might think well trees are still good for biodiversity and, and yes they are um, but they tend to become abandoned the lack of rejuvenation means those hedges eventually disappear they turn into lines of trees and then they turn into inv individual trees and then they go so uh, that that's that is a real problem for the countryside so just a, a quick bit of data from the work that I did on the 
PFLA farms. So these two graphs at the top just show some results where we compared the data from countryside survey from a very large number of plots all over the country, uh, countryside survey with the pasture fed livestock plots on the grassland. And we found that those pasture fed livestock plots were very sort of characteristic of neutral grassland um, rather than the improved uh, agriculturally improved grassland and hence they had a much higher species richness, a significantly higher species richness than the improved grassland and a significantly higher fall richness, so that's the non-grass species. And when we looked at the countryside survey data, we looked in detail at these very large number of countryside survey plots. We, we tried to do this for the PFLA plots, but we only had sort of 56, whereas in countryside survey we had uh, tens of, uh, well, not tens of thousands, but thousands. Uh, and we found that the CS data showed us that where you had plots with more plant species, there was lower soil phosphorus. Uh, and we know that soil phosphorus from diffuse pollution is a serious problem for biodiversity in water bodies. Um, where you had higher species richness, you had higher richness of bird and butterfly food plants. You, had you have higher soil carbon and soil moisture and higher numbers of soil taxa. So there are really important relationships between above ground biodiversity and below ground biodiversity. And just to link that a bit to profitability, because I think that's important for farmers uh, to understand how biodiversity relates to profitability. And we see that... Um, in, in the pasture-fed livestock uh, farms, the results on the left uh, in the blue are, are the pasture-fed livestock gross margins per suckler cow. And those on the right are the, those results from the farm business survey for gross margins per suckler cow. And you can see that the blue bars are essentially quite a bit higher than the yellow bars. So we're saying that the gross margins on the suckler cows for pasture-fed livestock were higher. Uh, and we, we think that is mainly due to lower costs because they're not putting so many inputs or any inputs on, on those farms and to shorter supply chains. So this productivity, profitability, biodiversity thing that uh, I showed you at the beginning, which said that in most cases, intensive and profitable grassland uh, appears to be incompatible with maintaining high levels of biodiversity may be questionable. So this graph shows a relationship between how profitable your land is and how biodiverse it is. And on the top left, if it's very profitable, it may well be very low in biodiversity. So that could be something like intensive dairy farming, where uh, the species, where lays are uh, just very species poor. Sorry, the slides are moving on faster than I want them to. Um, so. I'll do it again. So, uh, and at the bottom of that axis is where we've got very high biodiversity, uh, but low profitability. So that could be like uh, conservation grazing or nature reserves, where you don't get a lot of income for that, but the biodiversity is very high. Um, but results from the PFLA, as we've just seen, suggest that profitable grassland production may be compatible with higher levels of biodiversity. Uh, so we could have a different kind of relationship, which, uh, it, there is a sort of midpoint where biodiversity can be high and profitability can be high. I, I still would maintain that where you've got very high biodiversity, it's quite difficult to produce um, a lot of uh, livestock product. Uh, hence, you know, it may be that that re remains low in profitability. Unless suddenly the government decide to pay a lot more for biodiversity, perhaps through schemes, and then perhaps that profitability would be higher. But um, I, I would sort of argue that higher, that the, the potential for profitability and biodiversity to go hand in hand can result from higher quality products, uh, these lower inputs, or perhaps from higher income from biodiversity. So finally, just my thoughts on what we can do to restore pastoral biodiversity. I think we can retain what we've got um, and manage it, continue to manage it for biodiversity. Um, sorry about the speed. Uh, we can restore semi-natural grassland on less productive land. So produce prior biodiversity as a priority. So it can, you know, be, be the focus rather than producing uh, livestock products uh, and manage less intensively. 
Uh, there are things you'd ha you have to do to restore swords. Uh, they don't just magically restore um, that the seed bank may not be there uh, locally or in the soil. So you might have to add seeds and plants. You might need to reduce soil nutrients in those systems. But on more productive land, I think there are methods for producing both food and biodiversity jointly, which are viable for farmers. Some of our farmers may show us some of that. Um, and the other thing uh, for me that I think is really important is to plant trees and hedges on and around our pastures because they make a huge difference to biodiversity at the farm level um, and, and, and that's me finished. Thank you Lisa, very fascinating and very professionally prepared um, and so encouraging and um, that you're providing the evidence that underwrites that, that's really lovely, thank you very much. Um, Annie, Annie is in California so I think it's about 1.30 in the morning there um, Annie is a PhD uh, student uh, at Oxford researching how some agricultural practices like managed mob grazing can involve non-human animals to mitigate climate change and biodiversity loss. And she asked me for access to some of our farmers, which I, I did, but the quid pro quo was she was going to look at our biodiversity studies as they came out and, and tell us what she thought of them. So Annie, going and, to I, <laughs> and I've been ha happy to do so. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And I'm going to share my screen, just sharing some of these lessons and key takeaways uh, from the PFLA biodiversity case studies that you can find, as John introduced um, earlier in the introduction, on the PFLA website. There are 11 case studies at the moment, but we're coming out with more constantly. And so what I did is I reviewed these um, and looked at overall themes and takeaways and lessons um, that farmers and the like can actually put into practice um, from the farmers that we're learning from in the case studies. Now, the first lesson that I came across was be open to unexpected collaborations. They work, uh, literally. An unexpected collaboration, for example, is collaborating with nature and your grazing animals, thinking about nature as an ally rather than a provider. Um, a lot of the farmers were talking about their animals as partners in management rather than tools. Um, for example, that Invermectin-free dung really invigorates the biodiversity um, and the profit profitability or, or net income you can get from your land. Also, collaborations with other farmers and landowners. In this conference, we've heard a lot about land sharing, and a lot of the farmers that did, wrote case studies um, talked about you know, needing to tenant surrounding land to actually uh, get the biodiversity goals that they wanted. The second main lesson from these case studies was about being adaptable and taking measurements in your own way and noticing changes to biodiversity on your farm. Um, for example, a lot of farmers that wrote case studies were taking photographs or creating art, um, conducting surveys of their own or bringing in external uh, people with knowledge to supplement um, and do surveys on their biodiversity. Um, and allowing this land to guide your management and farming practices, adapting to different indicators. For example, changing your rotation of your mob grazing um, based on, on the number of animals you have or the weather of that day. And the final kind of overall lesson from these case studies is about enjoying a business environment win-win. Um, as somebody who's worked in the environmental space for a long time, this is very rare. Um, and we're seeing this on these farms. By decreasing your inputs, for example, a lot of farmers you know, could sell off farm machinery, decrease fertilizer and stop purchasing that and save themselves time in the end, um, you can increase your net income. Um, and this decrease in inputs has coincidental biodiversity benefits. Um, even if biodiversity isn't your key focus, you're seeing that along with the business side of things. Um, and ultimately it increases the resilience of your land. Um, so these were just three takeaways from the case studies that I got, um, but I know that we're going to be hearing from more farmers today and uh, some of the ones that wrote them, so I'm excited to learn more lessons from them. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Spot on time. And um, yeah, re really appreciate your objective um, uh, inputs. Um, now we're going to pass over to, to Denise, uh, Denise Walton. Um, Denise farms uh, Phelan Farm in Berwickshire, together with Chris, her husband, and Angus, uh, son, and family, the partnership. Um, Denise is a qualified ecologist, 
and um, I think for 20 years run an, an ecological practice. Um, they've done, she's organic, they are, sorry, they are organic, um, certified pasture for life, and she's recently become a director of the PFLA. And Denise has played a key role in helping um, in helping them develop this biodiversity initiative that, that we're we're sharing now. So Denise, can I pass the ball to you? Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Good morning, everybody. So we'll just get this going. Great. So basically, we are a 670 acre commercial farming business. Um, as John mentioned, we're organic. We also have an on-farm butchery with, from which we sell direct to our customers. Uh, we're predominantly... Yes, my, I have my screen on. Oh, hang on. Lovely, everybody can see that. Sorry, I'll just... Um, so you would have heard 670 acre commercial um, business, predominantly beef. Um, organic and we have an on-farm butchery from which we sell direct to our customers. Um, to put the farm in the context of what Lisa was uh, describing in terms of grassland, we are predominantly an improved grassland farm with about 3% of semi-natural acidic and wet grassland and 5% is permanent pasture which also includes that acidic grassland. Um, the rest is improved grassland. So just very quickly by way of background, because it's very much part of our journey, is that Chris and I started as new ancient smallholders on 20 acres in 1990. Um, we, our ambition was always to farm agroecologically, to sell direct. Our plan initially was to milk sheep and have a few pigs. We were then approached by our neighbor uh, to farm with her. And within three years, we were farming 670 acres and what we took on was a very intensively overgrazed farm which was essentially pretty decrepit. Uh, there were very very few hedgerows, those that existed were very gappy, there were no fences, the northern part of the farm had been intensively arably farmed but not very productively so it had received a lot of agrochemicals and prior to us taking it on. Our vision was very much still to be organic and to sell direct. Initially, we couldn't afford to go organic. Um, so we really had to work the farm conventionally, but on a very low input basis. We were lucky in that we had a small hotspot, you'll see that in yellow, uh, between the northern and southern areas of the farm, which really was a source of, of considerable biodiversity for us. Um, this story isn't about huge species rarity, but it is about how we've increased biodiversity. So please don't expect necessarily that I'm going to come up with enormous results at the end, but it's been a slow burn journey, but with some very good results. So 30 years later, you can see some of those results um, I've assessed our biodiversity hotspot through indicator species has increased by about 20%. You can see we've increased the habitat structure of the farm quite considerably. You can see the statistics there. In particular, in terms of habitat and ecosystem dynamics, we've connected different habitats. You can see I've got these 38 nodal connections, which is, if you like, an expression of the number of habitats that are conjoined. And we know as ecologists, that's where you tend to get greater species diversity. And density, again, as ecologists, we know structurally that the more edge you have, the more options you're giving um, species the chance to survive and to thrive. So, Really, the story has been one while we've had to farm commercially and with a bottom line in mind all the time. It's really what we've learned in 30 years is allowing the farm and the ecosystem of our locality to express itself. So we've released the farm in our journey from a very tight, intensive farming grip to a more relaxed approach, which hasn't 
compromised commercial, the commercial capacity of our farm. But it's been a journey for us in learning to trust nature as an ally. And this has resulted for us in a very different relationship with our farm, which actually is extremely rewarding for all of us. So this change has been um, driven by livelihood, the need to survive on our farm, and by livestock. So these are the agents of agroecological change. Personally, I knew as soon as we started farming our small holding, um, what I wanted to see on our farm, but always knew that we had to be commercial to survive. We didn't come onto our farm or our small holding with any old money. We were new entrants um, with a passion and a vision. Uh, we both, Chris and myself, and now our son Angus, who's developed into an extremely good stockman, love livestock. Um, and we love engaging directly with customers, supplying them with our meat. In the last 30 years, we've engaged fully in agri-environment schemes we would never have afforded to have improved the biodiversity of our farm without government policy and um, grant support. So I'm looking at this in terms of agroecological change and cascading benefits in terms of our release of our farm area to its natural capacity. We've seen a cascade of benefits. So the first thing is actually providing boundaries for fields and for our livestock, providing shelves from wind, habitat, biodiversity, very important biosecurity as well, um, through foot and mouth disease and uh, kind of respiratory diseases. So I know we're dealing with that very much as a human species, but it's very important in ruminant species as well, and um, connectivity. Uh, wildlife corridors and also giving our farm which was a bleak windy place a sense of space and a spe sorry a sense of place which is a very important relationship with the human connection so 45,000 hedgerow plants later and approximately six kilometers of hedgerow later 30 years later we've got a farm that really is beginning to function as a proper ecosystem Twenty fourteen, well, twenty thirteen. I first learned about pasture for life, and I thought, my goodness me! Suddenly, we've got a common sense approach to a gold standard system of managing our farm. We've been organic since two thousand and five, so our farm has had no agrochemicals whatsoever since two thousand and five. Prior to which, of course, we were low input anyway. Um, pasture for life suddenly opened the doors even more for us and for me as an ecologist to the more in-depth management of our land but it also meant that we had to really watch grazing and manage our grazing as well and also watch our cattle with a much closer eye in terms of their health and their sort of um their satiation from grass and their kind of ruminant uh, well-being, if you like. So the one thing that I learned, which was an extraordinary revelation to me, was if you see this, the first, the, the, the bottom image on the left-hand side, this was taken last year, and we've adopted from a set stocking system, we've now adopted a rotational mob grazing system. So we've split large fields into 10 acre paddocks and we are still learning but we're grazing for three days with 10 cattle 10 cows and a bull we have 150 cattle 10 cows and a bull graze for three days then we leave it for 30 days in this 10 acre paddock well, the bottom left hand was an improved permanent grassland pasture and you can see immediately that we've got a diversity of structure and of species and this is learning the importance of rest rest and diversity in otherwise quite dynamic ecosystems or habitats which grasslands are um, we also produce a lot of clover silage 
and we use red clover and white clover to restore soil condition and um, fertilizing with nitrogen. Livestock dung and the organic matter cycle, I just feel that dung is the forgotten driver of ecosystem function. And if you look closely, you can see those are our cow pats and sheep droppings. Um, there's evidence of dung beetles. Uh, the third image on the right to the right has actually got an, um, a dung beetle grub. So this isn't about slurry pit dung. This is dung falling from the ruminants straight onto grazed pasture and ivermectin free and ideally ultimately um, wormer free. But we need to work at that. This is an area as farm managers that we really need to work on. So in dung, we know that dung in its own right, carpets in their own rights are mini niche habitats and they support a multitude of insects, which are a very important source of feed, again, from multitude of diversity higher up if you like, the trophic levels, um, sort of ecologically speaking. So I see dung as, and forgive the mixed metaphor, the keystone to the cascade of benefits that come from the pa our pastoral journey of biodiversity. So we've got on our farm, this very left-hand image, that's a corn bunting. We're part of the, um, South East, part of the east of Scotland, a project for corn buntings. Um, corn buntings were um, identified by the RSPB as extinctionally, as it functionally extinct in uh, east of Scotland, sorry, southeast Scotland. Um, last year we saw two corn buntings, the year before we saw one corn bunting. It's only the male that appears. Um, so we're seeing corn buntings most years on the farm. Uh, we then have a tree uh, sparrow, which again is a threatened species. These are increasing in number on our farm. We've got curlew. They are much more present on our farm and they are basically dependent on dung. We see a lot more evidence of um, barn owls on the farm because of um, the way we manage grass and the way that we actually leave grassland along our hedgerow banks. So can these you, are all species you, that depend. Can, can you? Yes. Can you, yep, fine. Yep. Okay, sorry. So very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've got key habitat indicator species that we've ident identified through um, species um, diversity uh, surveys on the farm mixed farmland, wetland plant specialists, we've got the national rarity, we've also got pearl border fertility for the first time in direction for 150 years. So we can demonstrate that the function that's been re reintroduced to our farm on the basis of partial biodiversity journey is working. So also the very last slide is partial biodiversity and food production. So um, we, we can produce 500 kilos within a 15 to 20 month period on our farm on grass only no 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 grain at all and we know because our meat was part of the Newcastle University research into the relationship between uh, pastoral diversity and nutritional density of meat that um, meat coming from uh, diverse pastures has a very high level of nutrients particularly omega-3 and we can demonstrate that that has been proven with our meat and Thank you very much. I hope I haven't overrun time too much. <laughs> Thank Denise. Well, I mean, there's so much to share. Um, I'm, what's important to me is it, it's a working farm. You talk about trusting nature as an ally, about the late, uh, livestock as an agent of agroecological change, the vital role of government support, the vital role of dung. Um, there's so much in there to take away. Thank you. Andy, I'm going to pass over to Andy Rumming now who farms at Waterhay Farm near Cricklade and near Swindon on the banks of the Juvenile River Thames. The land is flooded. Um, it's very biodiverse. And he is hugely knowledgeable about wildlife. Whenever I see him, he's got binoculars welded to his chest, um, as, as have his two children, Isabel and David. They're always there with their binoculars. Um, 
and he's most recently been developing certified uh, leather from um, certified uh, cattle. Andy, I pass the board to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, John. Now, can you hear me? Is that all right? Yep. Good. So hopefully on your screen, you can see uh, a group of our cattle um, stood in the River Thames. So we're right on the Wiltshire, Gloucestershire border, um, partway between Sirencester and Swindon. So kind of in sort of the middle of Southern England. Um, our business is, I'll describe it as sort of completely cow centric, or sort of bovine focused. And we've got 90 suckler cows um, on 120 acres and it's all permanent pasture. Um, the uh, let's move forward a slide so we have right so really important thing is the Thames so it's a really wet farm and um, each winter at least a third of it floods and floods to a couple of feet in depth and so this is uh, you know often seen as a bit of a negative thing but actually the opportunity is that it produces uh, a really big range of seasonal habitats for wildlife. Um, but before we get onto that, I'd just like to say that uh, the cows are the engine room for our whole business. And we actually make our money by, we sell some store cattle live, um, but more and more we're putting more of our cattle uh, and it will be over half this year through our own on-farm butchery um mainly selling to local customers we don't really mail order out hardly anything um we're also got some uh, on-site glamping and that is very cow focused and uh getting people to barbecue look at cows and enjoy the wildlife and then as john said um leather goods which go live this year so we have um we're managing our cattle a little bit similar to Denise in that they get moved daily. We're pasture for life certified. Um, we're not using wormers and we're trying to produce our, our animals in a really ethical way. And the byproduct of that is um, quite a lot of biodiversity, an increasing amount of biodiversity. Um, we've got two generations on the farm. Um, and so we've got very little land in any agro-environment scheme. So that is a, a minimal part of our income. So we're having to make it commercially stack up. We're also seeing that the end of farm subsidies will come pretty soon. And I'm pretty pessimistic that we'll want to engage in much of the agro-environment schemes that are coming forward. So we have to make the farm pay. And I think that uh, the biodiversity is a huge opportunity. Um, we've got, I'm quite interested in fungi, and uh, this is a St George's mushroom, and they only exist in uh, pasture land, and they can't be grown in um, uh, commercially because they exist in this really tiny layer between the bottom of the plant and the top of the soil. They're really good eating, and more and more of them are cropping up. I do have to fence the cows out of the best spots, otherwise I've never yet to eat any. Um, but they are a really good indicator that things are kind of going right. Um, well, I'm also interested in the fact that with lots of biodiversity, I always think of farming as having a, a, a line of levers, almost like a signalman in a signal box. And when you pull levers, you get different effects. Um, and with more biodiversity, um, you can kind of change that by pulling the levers in different orders but actually biodiversity gives you extra levers levers that you never saw and so i'm always interested how we can kind of stack enterprises but also how we can stack biodiversity so on our cattle buildings we're installing uh, swift boxes and swifts their productivity um so sort of swallow has got is five times more productive than swift so it has three broods it lays more eggs um whereas swift numbers are going down and they take such a long time to go forward. So this is costing us a bit of plywood and a bit of paint and we're installing these, um, but it is a long job. So it takes about three years from when you put them up to get, we get your first swift. So I'm really interested in how we can augment and give biodiversity a hand, but I also find this really interesting and it makes life more fulfilling on the farm, having a large amount of biodiversity. Um, 
here's a, a pretty picture. Now, I think it's really important to say that very few of our pastures look like this at, at, for very long. Um, and this is one of our, our better ones. But here I was experimenting with leaving strips ungrazed out of rotation. And I found that I can actually graze, I can get a rotation in fairly early. I can then get 50% of the flowers I would have had go to actually flower. And so I can still get three rotations out of this field um, rather than four. And, and so it, what's really interesting is just keeping a few notes, taking a few pictures. Um, I think I can layer in biodiversity and that graph that Lisa showed us, I thought it was really interesting. I want to be in the extreme uh, right hand upper corner. So I want loads of biodiversity. And I think I can probably get more biodiversity than the nature reserve next door because I've got a cheaper way of producing a mosaic of habitats, which is these folks in the background. Um, and I also think that by stacking those enterprises, by selling the meat, the hides, um, the visitor experiences, I can actually improve that profitability. And I, and I know that, you know, from selling our meat direct, there's a thousand pound gross margin extra. That's our target on each animal. And so I do think that with innovative thinking, using a bit of technology, trying to stack things up, um, you know, you can, you can move towards that top corner of that graph. So I'm just going to click on, right. Now, one of the things I sort of wanted to cover was, I think it can get a bit uh, daunting, especially on social media. Lots of people are sharing pictures of their best orchids, and their best fields. And, um, you know, we've got some terrible fields with uh, compaction issues that we've got to sort out um, that haven't been treated very well in the past. Um, and we don't have a lot of wildlife there. And so I'm trying to kind of work with those and look at those. And I think it can be a bit overwhelming to kind of identify everything. And people say, you know, do you need to know all the species, all the biodiversity on your farm? And the answer is you can't possibly do that because it's, it's a huge job. But I do think there is a real benefit to trying to upskill yourself and try and understand what you've got, which then leads to what you might have had and what you could have in the future. And so there's there's more tools than ever at people's disposals to do this. And so the first thing to do, and it's already been said, um, is to partner with other local experts. And so there's a guy in the village next to me who's the British expert on sawflies, okay? Which are tiny little things, but they are, and there's, they go on particular trees. But, you know, I can't possibly know all about those, but I'm happy to walk around with him and he shows me stuff. Um, and it all kind of builds a picture and it builds an evidence base. I also find it personally really interesting. We're also in an age where we've got a fantastic range of books and web resources. And if you want to screenshot this, this is just a few of the ones available at the moment. Um, and they're really accessible. And there's been a massive change in the last five years in field guides and these um, uh, wild guides ones are brilliant. They are a real game changer. And the laminated field studies guide fold out sheets. They're also great because you can take them around with you. They're waterproof um, and yes, they, they kind of last. So there's lots of stuff out there and there's lots of people probably that live quite close to you that have got a real deep knowledge. And most counties in England have got a atlas of bird species and an atlas of plants. So I would encourage you to buy one of these, have a look at it, and contact some people to help you if needed. Um, so um, I just finish with a picture of one of our stakes head fertilities. So um, we're quite lucky to have this plant. It's pretty rare. We make hay on a field that has got 80% of the Britain's population in one place. We don't own that. We just have an annual license. Um, and again, we probably make, uh, that's probably the place where perhaps we make the most significant impact and it's just an annual haymaking license. And so um, it's great. And it can be really useful for marketing. So for example, on our uh, leather belts, we have um, the fertility logo. And uh, sorry, it's a screenshot sharing. Yeah, I don't know whether you can see that. But on our belts, 
we have it stamped into them. So um, I, I actually think that wildlife for me is personally fulfilling. It is um, it's profitable. And there are lots of unintended things that crop up. And I think you get more of them with more biodiversity. So um, yeah, I'll call it a day there. Andy, that's uh, tremendous. You're just highlighting the importance of being commercially savvy. And I see on the Q&A, there's people asking about what we mean by profit. I tend to, look, to use the word net income. Um, it's the same thing, but uh, as you know, you can't be green if you're in the red. Um, and this idea of stacking uh, biodiversity. So many, many thanks for that, Andy. Uh, could I just, um, for speakers, could you just check in the Q&A? Uh, Andy, there's a question for you. Uh, there's a couple of questions for you, Denise, about Invermectin and things in there. So we could come back to them later, but if we could just look at those and answer them, that may help us um, uh, uh, keep to time. So now I'm going to pass over to Bella and Toby, who farm at Millbarton Farm in Devon. Uh, Toby is also a landscape um, architect, 100 acre farm that's going through reversion. They've planted thousands of native trees and six kilometers of hedgerows on a 100 acre farm. So uh, Bella and Toby, could I pass the ball to you? Thank you. Hello everybody, we're just um, sharing our screen. Hope you can see it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, we it's approximately 100 because it's less than that our main parcel is pretty small um 70 acres including uh, all the farmyard and houses and everything we are in mid devon um we are between 150 and 200 meters above sea level so um pretty wet uh three years ago it was um predominantly improved grassland which was let on grazing licenses and given the weather etc we could get three cuts of silage off this land every summer year in year out and all of that silage went to other farms didn't have any any livestock at that time so it was a, a pretty sad state of affairs um, my parents bought a couple of cows from a friend, some Devon Reds pictured here. And we've been slowly growing the herd, Toby and I, since then, planting thousands of trees, looking after the hedgerows in the traditional Devon way, which is cutting and laying. So we never use a flail. Um, it's, a, it's between a 10 and 25 year rotation, which is incredible for diversity, incredible for our animals, incredible for things like water storage and um shelter in the sun shelter in the in the rain all of that kind of thing so we've now got up to 21 cattle um as well as horses the two work really well together they cross graze really effectively so on the worming front that's um i'll go into a little bit later we also have pigs every other year we try and sort of respond to the land rather than plan for it and we haven't been able to get them more regularly because they do make such a mess in this kind of landscape we have them sort of extensive in a in a, in a woodland a young woodland and um we're hoping that in the years to come that will we'll be able to gradually increase how many we have this is um a field that we recently bought um, <laughs> that is what it looks like or what it looked like this summer. Um, you can see there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of topsoil here at the top, but all of this is subsoil. It's been um, arable for probably over a century on and off, but recently it was um, fodder beet and we walked past it every week and it brought us to tears it came up for sale and we bought it so we are about to um, use our animals and our methods to return this 25 acre field to what it should be which is essentially moorland moorland edge this is at 200 meters so it's exceptionally marginal so um, that's where we're at 
this is a, a slide of, of the sward uh, three years ago. So you can see there that that is essentially just rye and fat, fat cows. <laughs> <laughs> and this is last summer, um, similar, similar um, time of year. And the, the difference in diversity through a change in in grazing rotation and over sowing and over seeding as well, which we did. Um, that is where we're at at the moment. And that is what we're hoping to achieve on every single inch of our pasture um, over the coming years. So, your turn? Yeah. Hello, everybody. So, um, pretty much the key component, apart from many hours of musing over the breakfast table is these guys, a herd of um, pedigree Devon Reds, which initially we had out on the land extensively. And that coincided with the first restoration piece that we did of a field that we call Hake Bottom, which was our own of different mixes by the Devon Wildlife Trust. And then as we've continually enhanced and iterated the, the system and, and, and understood more and more about the grass and ecology, we've, we've brought these guys more and more into play in terms of the key managers. We use them across the entire farm through the woodlands, the bogs, the wetted areas, the dry, the dry meadows. And if it wasn't for them, um, we wouldn't have what we have today, there's no doubt. We do engineer the way that they graze really specifically from a biodiversity perspective. So I would say that 95% of the decisions that we make on the land are based around how we can get the best responses from the land by using the cattle in the right place at the right time. And we're extremely um, non-regimental in how we holistically graze them as it were. If we know that we've got an area that's in recovery and we'd like some plants to flower, similar to what Andy was saying, we'll actually just cut that out of the rotation for a couple of months. And so from a rotational perspective, we're trying to push out to about three to four months. Um, but what we do do is in the autumn um, is, is actually open them up to do some more extensive grazing as some of our hay fields come back into doing the kind of traditional aftermath. And I think what's really important for us to say is that we're in a location which is pretty remarkable from, from a biodiversity perspective. We're on the Culm Measures, which has its own national character area. It's a, an area from sort of mid Devon all the way up through North Devon to the Heartland Peninsula, where there's extremely deep, heavy clays. There's traditionally not been that much in the way of arable. And the pastures here are exceptionally rushy. And actually there is a type of grass and called calm grass and which is a priority habitat, which, um, which, 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 which has many of the species that you're seeing in. Unfortunately, a lot of these species are right on the, on, on the brink of extinction and things like uh, in our area, things like quail, curlew, for example, were seen here for up until the eighties. We do still see golden plover, which is middle left, um, however, only small numbers and uh, the, the Book of Witheridge, which is the village just above us, speaks of thousands of them returning to both breed and over winter. Grasshopper warblers not heard so much anymore. Um, and then the, the thought of hearing a corncrake or a turtle dove is, is no longer part of our, um, you know, part of the language of the land, which is what we're all trying to, to bring back. We do, however, have some absolutely remarkable biodiversity still in play across the landscapes, um, both on our farm and close to home. Things like the lesser butterfly orchids, very rare alcamilla species, small pearl bordered fritillary. Um, there's narrow bordered bee hawk moths on a, on a more close to a small copper marsh fritillary, large skipper, etc. But as always, uh, is you know the case of what we're looking at here is these are very very small isolated pockets, and I'm afraid that one of the biggest issues for us with regards to our pastoral biodiversity is is the intensification of the land to a level of mechanisation and um, a number of days actually managing the landscape with heavy machinery, which which literally leaves biodiversity I'm afraid nowhere to go. So our goal is the complete antithesis of that and coming up are some of what we're doing, learnings and et cetera, which, which is making the difference. 
So we're lucky enough to live in an area where reciprocity is, is greatly valued. So um, in the top left picture, this is Marcus. He's our He's essentially a mentor for us and he lives up the road in a yurt that he built in a wood which he bought in order to save it from, you know, going to rack and ruin. And, and he's, been a, he's been a huge help to us throughout this journey. And um, in the background is Jess. She came for work experience. We do a lot of work experience. We're gonna do more and more of that because in this, in this world, we've realized how much people value just simple connection to the land literally having your feet on the on your on the ground and your in your hands in the dirt just that immersion is is clearly a really important thing for um for people for their mental health so a few methods we use for diversity this is a rick hey rick that we've decided we do we outwintered in this field and we decided to leave a couple of um or to get a couple of our older cattle out there over winter to graze off this is in restoration this this sward so we wanted them to make sure it stayed low over winter thereby meaning they probably would need some supplementary feed we built two ricks in this field the first time we've ever done it the hay has stayed sweet throughout despite the level of rain we get it's absolutely astounding there's an outer layer which is crusty and nasty and the inside smells like summer as soon as they open it up we built two they destroyed one straight away and pooed on it and lay on it and the other one they just picked through perfectly as we'd hoped throughout the whole time they're in that field we never had to take them any hay and um that that hay was made on that field and has been pooed back out on that field. So as, as far as sort of closed loop farming, we're pretty happy with that and we'll do it again next year for, for definite. Here we move our troughs around when we're mob grazing in the summer um, and the areas around those troughs therefore get a lot more hammering. We um, always, so after the cattle have left the, left the paddock or before they have, so here's a load of yellow rattle that um, they, they will trample in as they as they go to this trough. And these little islands of biodiversity do work. Like within one year, you will see all of the flower seed that you drop in the wake of the cattle come up the next year. It's quite astounding. So the ivermectin thing, which has come up a couple of times, we cross graze our cattle and horses religiously. They, um, horses poo and we in, in latrines and cattle don't. Um, they have different different ways of digesting their feed and they suffer from different gut parasites so they can graze over each other's poo um, and not be affected and we never worm any animals on our farm we haven't for years and years so there's nothing chemical coming out of them um, going back into the ground it's it's a free, simple, natural way of doing it. And it's how nature does it. If we didn't even think about it, nature does that for it for itself. So it's just that sort of intuition, knowing that nature has got it figured out. It's just trying not to interfere. If you've got the ability to cross graze, you can cross graze as other animals. It doesn't have to be horses and cattle. It is a hugely effective, massive help for diversity. Uh, Bella. So it, yes. Bella. Yeah, just another minute, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Um, this is Toby at the bottom planting plugs. We uh, do a lot of that just to keep things moving along swiftly. A few more pictures of us doing our thing. Top left is um, leaving wide margins when we do cut hay, which again is a huge help for uh, small mammals, especially. We try and encourage our contractors to cut from the inside out, which they don't really enjoy doing, but it gives everything in the field a chance to get to the edges. We've already had a had a bit about poo, so we'll ignore that for now, but just to say the picture on the bottom left shows where the woodcock come out at night and siphon through the poo to um, get their feed. <laughs> and that's the cattle doing their work. We'll just conclude by saying that um, I think it's hugely important when thinking about biodiversity to, to react to the landscape, to allow the landscape to guide you, it will provide, and to use intuition and not feel that you must have to explain everything scientifically all the time. It helps, you can always find guidance, um, but intuition is a, is a really powerful tool. And uh, just to be present and to observe, apart from anything, it will make you feel good. So um, yeah, and lastly as well, just to say that if anybody wants to find out more about probably one of the most beautiful 
wildflower communities in Britain, you can have a look at Farming Today's recent episode, um, which includes Pete Burgess from the Devon Wildlife Trust talking about it. Um, yeah. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Gosh, that's amazing. I mean, we could go on and, and on. <laughs> but thank you so much, uh, I mean, I've, the importance of hedge lane, responding to the land, reciprocity. It's all about poo, reacting to the landscape, being present. These are, these are great things to take away. And I'm going to pass over now to um, Professor E.J. Milner Gulland. E.J., if I can call you that. Uh, she's the Tasso Leventis Professor of Biodiversity and the head of the Department of Zoology at Oxford University. Um, we've been sharing these case studies and we've been seeking her uh, uh, opinions. Um, we hope to work more close. This is the first time actually we've ever seen each other, although we've talked many times uh, on, on email. Um, and we'd really like you to see from your perspective, what have you taken away from, from the, the case studies that you've done and, and what you've heard today. So over to you, EJ, thank you. Thanks, John, and thanks to everyone who's presented today. It's so inspiring. It's really just wonderful and exciting to hear what you've been doing. Um, and I just feel, yeah, really privileged to have heard what you've had to say. Um, so um, John wanted me to um, frame this into a kind of broader framing and the framing that I like to use to think about the issues that we're facing on this planet is something called the Triple Challenge, which is something that WWF um, has kind of highlighted. And that is that the challenge facing humanity is to keep um, our climate change um, below 1.5 degrees. It's to restore nature to the position that it needs to be in to have a healthy planet. And it's to make sure that humanity can flourish on our planet. Um, and that's a kind of that's a big challenge to have. Um, I like that framing because for a number of reasons, and, and one of those is that um, it kind of um, maps onto the international conventions that all our countries are signed up to. So the Convention on Biological Diversity for Nature, the UNFCCC for the Climate Change, and the Sustainable Development Goals for Humanity. Our governments have signed up to really, really bold global targets. And many of our governments, including the UK's, have national level targets um, linked to those international conventions. That means we can hold government's feet to the fire around these things. So that's one reason for that triple challenge being useful. Another reason is that it really, for me, highlights that we have trade-offs as well as synergies. You know, we love to highlight win-wins, but um, win-wins don't happen everywhere and certainly not without, um, you know, graft. So we have synergies and trade-offs between those three elements of the challenge. And we need to feed those big international targets down into real landscapes with real people and real trade-offs at, at the scale at which people actually operate. So for example, in this country, we have um, you know, a push for national infrastructure, a push for more national housing to meet the needs that we have. We also have a, a target for biodiversity net gain we also have targets for climate change, mitigation, and adaptation, and we also have a need for food security. And, and I think the big question that we all have to answer, and particularly researchers, I guess, and governments, is does this actually com compute these, all these different things that we want from our landscapes? And um, we want to make sure that it doesn't compute by just exporting our problem. So we can't just get um, everything from abroad um, and ruin their chances of meeting their triple challenge without, um, and then meet our own. So we need to have honest negotiation, honest understanding of where these trade-offs exist and where the synergies are. The other reason why I like to frame it in these terms is that uh, we, we hear a lot about climate change and biodiversity is coming up on the wings, but it's still under um, underappreciated. And certainly when I talk to business, when I talk to government and so on, often biodiversity is the poor relation. And of course, biodiversity is interlinked with climate change, but there are biodiversity issues that, that aren't climate change. And everyone who's talked today is aware of that. Runoff, invasives, land conversion, that's not about climate change, that's about us ruining our nature. So that's the first thing is this framing is quite useful. The second thing is what I love about the Pasture for Life Association is, is the seizing of the narrative. You know, livestock is demonized um, and, despite it being part of a 
natural, healthy, productive agricultural system. And that's true, uh, not just here, but it's also true for pastoralists in semi-arid grasslands um, around the world, who are people who I've worked with for many years. Um, there's also a general lack of interest in pasture as a carbon store, as a place for biodiversity. And that's worldwide as well with the focus on forests. And, and you know, we, as people who care about pasture, really have to seize that narrative to change that. I think one of the um, papers that's been incredibly influential over the last few years is the paper in science by Joseph Paul and, and Nemechek. And that was interesting because the message the media took from that paper was, was go vegan. But actually, there was a more important message in that paper, and that was about the huge variation in outcomes within a given sector. So, for example, for beef, for beef herds, you know, the highest impact 25% of producers was 56% of the whole beef herds greenhouse gas emissions and 61% of the land use. So that second message about variation really didn't penetrate. And I think we do have to combat the simple narratives that the media like. Um, and try to bring the nuance in and to bring the biodiversity in. The other thing I want to say is that, you know, pushing that narrative about the way that we fix food poverty, um, we don't fix food poverty by cheap food that comes with hidden environmental, so environmental costs, social costs, animal welfare costs. Food poverty requires an all systems approach that lifts people out of poverty so that they can afford good and healthy and environmentally socially sustainable food. Um, and that we actually need to understand and represent the true costs of cheap mass-produced food in the system. Um, another thing I think in the narrative that we need to seize is that we can't solve the problems of biodiversity restoration with protected areas alone. You know, there's a real narrative in the biodiversity and conservation space around 30 by 30, let's get 30% of the land um, into protection by 2030. And I think that's that's a simplistic partial solution. We also need productive landscapes. That rest of that 70% has to be uh, farmed in a way that's compatible with biodiversity. One way in, in which I think it's useful to frame things is with respect to a, a, um, a concept called shifting baseline syndrome. And that's a really prevalent uh, kind of psychological construct that is really useful for us to think about when we think about our messaging. What that is, is that people, there's two kinds. There's firstly the intergenerational baselines, which is that every new generation thinks about their landscape, their nature, their countryside with respect to their own childhood. And we all do it. And, um, and that means that as nature erodes, each person's baseline to which they want to return gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So that intergenerational shifting means that very soon, as a community, we lose our understanding of where we should be, what, what real nature looks like. That's one thing. And then there's an individual shifting baseline within our own minds, which we can change ourselves. So, you know, I grew up in the countryside in Sussex um, in the 1970s. You know, that was my kind of formative childhood. And there were lapwings everywhere. There were caterpillars everywhere. The grass was very, very much more biodiverse than it is now. And, and I forget that when I see what I see now. So we really have to combat intergenerational shifting baselines and individual shifting baselines. And I think, you know, trying to get people to understand not only what the countryside looked like, but what our food looked like. You know, the fact that meat was something that was special, that was um, something that we'd only have on a Sunday, for example, that we would have with the best quality, best cut that we could have. And that's something that we need to, remind people that it's quite recent, this shift to factory farmed um, food. Okay, so that's the shifting the narrative, seizing the narrative kind of thing. The third thing I wanted to mention was evidence. And I think, you know, we've had some wonderful evidence presented today. And I think, you know, evidence from the type of the type that you have gives power to the producer. It can feed through the supply chain. I would say to people that the research field here about the evidence around biodiversity is one of the most dynamic, fast changing field um, in, in our research. And so within two years, it's going to be so much easier for producers to be able to um, generate the evidence we need about biodiversity and its, and its impact on their production. Um, and so I think keep the faith about evidence. Uh, it's, go it's going to be much, much easier very soon. Sadly, government policy isn't necessarily evidence led. 
but there are other people we can talk to about evidence. There's the public, there's the media, there's real retailers. And most importantly, I think, as illustrated by our farmers ourselves. Another point I really liked and would like to highlight is the importance of collaboration. Um, and when we're speaking about evidence, you know, the, it's inspirational to see people collaborating with universities. I love the idea of work experience. There's the British Ecological Society who are worth talking to. There's CEH that Lisa's been with. Um, citizen science is such a powerful way of generating evidence. So collaboration that way. The other thing I think about is, is you know, we're not going to succeed with our triple challenge unless we scale, unless we have we go from small kind of pockets of excellence of the type we're seeing now to broad scale change in our food systems. I think it's useful then to think that there are three kinds of scaling. There's scaling within a landscape. So there's scaling from neighbor to neighbor to neighbor, and that's great. Uh, and that's important. That has one kind of collaboration needed, local collaboration. There's also scaling by sharing best practice between landscapes, between countries, between situations, and taking the generalizable from one landscape country to another. And I wonder if, uh, PFLA could think also about that kind of scaling. What, what are the things that we can learn between, between landscapes rather than within landscapes? And the third kind of scaling is through changing the system. And that again requires different kinds of collaboration, changing the context in which we're sitting so that it's more favorable for the things that we do. So I'd just like to fi finally, finally speak, stop by saying now is your time, you know, We've got this international framing that's that's good for us, international conventions, the national targets for biodiversity. We've got the reshaping of agriculture post Brexit. We've got a, a, a real push towards localism post pandemic. Can we move that? I think the public is ready for these kinds of positive narrative shifting messages. And you know, this shift from the negative to the positive that the PFLA are, are, um, are highlighting is really, really good. So. I'm going to thank you, and I'm just going to post also, as I thank you, a, um, a link to something called the Positive Communication Toolkit, which I found very useful, which I hope you will too. So thanks, and that's it. Well, well thank you very much, um, EJ. You've pressed a lot of buttons um, there. And in terms of, it's interesting when we've had a dialogue on the forum about how we get this message out, and one was about, about the emotional story um, and that picture of the egrets people were saying that catches people's imagination, but we also need the evidence. And, and we'd like to continue the dialogue. You know, we're already talking about one of your year four students. Um, we'd like to continue the dialogue with you to see how you can help us to create the evidence objectively rather than what people see when we provide it as being um, subjective. The question of food poverty, since we've started, we've had this issue of elite, not elitist, you know, it's an elite product, but how do we, how can we, how can we help people? We've had lots of initiatives we're trying to do on that. I'm with you on scale. I've spent five decades working in rural Africa and Asia, so I'm absolutely with you uh, on that. And, and we have good contacts there. And 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 now is our time. So um, thank you very much um, indeed uh, for that, EJ. I say we'll be in, in touch about uh, continuing our cooperation. Now, we have a, um, a little bit of time and we have um, Q&A. Um, my Q&A seems to have gone down. I've only got um, oh, the whole questions here. Um, a lot of the questions, I hope, have been answered by people actually on the, um, uh, no, they've been answered in, in the Q&A session themselves. But um, there's one, Denise, you, could you just say something about the, this worming question which has come up? Yes, thank you very much. So um, from our point of view, we do some worming, we do very little, um, and we worm only as part of our organic animal health plan, which we develop with our vet. Um, so while ultimately we would rather not worm, and that's what we're working towards in relation to how we look at plant species that can help with worm control, um, even possibly homeopathy, so we're beginning to look at that. 
um, there is a shift in parasite burdens in relation to shifting climate. Uh, when Chris and I first started farming here 30 years ago, fluke, for example, was rare. Now fluke is everywhere and we need to control it. Not least there are growing welfare issues with livestock that have to carry fluke. So um, we've got to be very sensible about this. We've got to exercise common sense. Um, ivermectins are a very, very destructive chemical. Um, ACA, they are the most effective pesticide um, and they should not be used if you want biodiversity to grow on your farms. So very rarely our vet has advised, especially where there's been a strong parasite burden with our cattle. For example, when we brought in a new herd to our cattle, they brought in um, a, a lower parasite resistance to our farm. So we had to address that with the assistance of pesticides. But now that they are growing in their resistance, we're using it less. So that points incidentally to um, actually developing uh, developing an on-farm in situ resistance to parasites by breeding your own replacements. So we're increasing the parasite resistance of our cattle. So I hope that answers uh, people's questions. Right, um, Andy, there was a question about leather. Did you, do you want to say anything more about that? Um, I will just briefly. So your best option is to listen to Sarah Grady and Alice Robinson at 11 o'clock in the community environment talk, who are the people who know about that. But basically, it's there. There are some opportunities for individuals to get hand, tied, uh, hides tanned, um, but you have to collaborate because no one will do any less than 50. So that's the way to do it. So, yeah, have a listen to Alice uh and sarah at 11 o'clock or watch their video on youtube afterwards and they will give you the information great thanks um and then toby and bella there's a, a sort of general questions in there about how you did the reversion um you know the, the, what what um whether you plowed and all this would you like to just summarize that <coughs> to um for, for anybody who's not been looking at the q a Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shall I go? Yeah, you do. Okay, so yeah, we basically the first major uh, wildflower meadow restoration was done with an initial power harrow. So we actually we took a cut of the of the grassland and baled that for hay. Then it was power harrowed just once, which broke up the sward. Now the, the sward in that case had been actually reverting from silage for about eight years. So it's actually beginning to show signs of being a more permanent native grassland sward, albeit the fog density was still almost zero. So because of the fact that the surrounding landscape had so little biodiversity, there'd been no influx of seed or anything that had started to augment that landscape. So then we worked with Devon Wildlife Trust to use a calm grassland mix from a chap called Cyril Cole, who's very sadly died, uh, who was close to us, who's got some of the finest calm grassland we'd ever seen, as well as a lowland meadow mix for a drier patch. And that was spread out across the landscape after that power harrowing was done. And then for the preceding winter, basically all the way through until February, we had sheep on the landscape because what that did is it kept the sward very very tight so either germination that was occurring in autumn or post spring or like spring germination was allowed to occur because the sward was really really low and so then as soon as that period goes through and then the growth rates were going up we left it and cut it for hay and have continued to do that ever since we switched out from using sheep a year ago and now only graze with cattle and the, the species density and diversity is now so good that actually this year on the drier meadow, we're going to leave it standing for standing seed and standing forage because we've got up to a density where we're content with. On some of the other meadows, what we're now doing is cutting the hay and then we're strewing it out in front of the cattle as we holistically graze them. So as they walk over the strew, they're then treading it in as they'd reduce the amount of grass in the, in the sward. So, 
as we're starting to get to a level where we have our own seed, we're then using much more of a sort of animal based approach to spreading it around. And that is also, uh, again, added to by um, taking our species rich hay, which is now baled in the shed, out to the outwintering cattle and spreading that in areas where they trampled. They'll feed on it, press the seed in, and invariably there's a little bit left in the hay. So that will then come up in the spring as well. So we're hopefully just going to create this explosion of, 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 of plant life. I think you're on mute, John. Sorry, we need to draw to a close. They're very firm on time. Um, um, thank you so much. We, we've, <laughs> it's been so inspiring and both to have and, and to have this collaboration between academia and, and working farms and everything has been on working farms. Um, do, do look, before I wind up, do look at the, uh, if you at the website, um, pastureforlife.org slash biodiversity, look at the case studies. We're already talking, and I want to thank Kate Bradshaw, and who I know is in here, who does all the work under the bonnet of the website, our aging website, to produce these case studies um, in, in the beautiful format that they are. And we've already been talking about producing a digital book um, that we can make available to people who are interested to raise the profile and link that to, to the evidence. Um, before we... Um, so as we close, I've just a few thoughts um, uh, that I would like to um, share with you. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen and put a picture up to, to um, sort of um, keep us in the mood. I was, uh, I was watching a session with, with Satish Kumar and Bindana Shiva yesterday in, some, in which somebody asked, and excuse me if I read some of this, where do we start if we want to bring about change? To which Satish Kumar replied, start with yourself, be the river. The Ganges starts as a trickle in the Himalayas. And this reminded me of an attempt I made a couple of years ago after some very serious flooding. I tried to encourage the Insurance Industry Association to recognize that the water that floods our towns and countryside starts as drops of rain falling on fields and woodlands that coalesce into streams and then rivers. And then to encourage them to spend the day um, learning from the farmers who are managing this land and harnessing and, and capturing this water uh, on, on their land before it contributes to the flood. flood. Well, I failed to persuade them. Uh, they, they thought, um, they didn't need they didn't need us but i came across this very powerful i don't know whether it's come through to you yet but this part very powerful picture of the rivers of wales and then this one of the rivers of the uk um, and i suppose what i'd like to say is what you've experienced today are some of the drops of pastoral biodiversity which are going to spread across the UK like these rivers, encouraged partly by examples like the, those that we've seen today, partly by a growing awareness of what nature offers without recourse to the bank manager, and partly by the pressures of rising energy and fertilizer prices. So be encouraged, be the river, this is what could happen. And if you want to remain in contact, then please do so uh, on the social group and also take a look um, at the Pasture for Life website. These details of people's contacts will be on the social group. Think about becoming a supporter of the PFLA. It's free and you'll be kept up to date or think about becoming a member. Um, it's hundred pounds and that hasn't changed since 2011. So that's really good value and benefit from the lively and informative forum. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to the ORFC team who pulled this all together over Christmas and the new year and the volunteers who've been with us today. And I hope you are leaving this session with warmth in your heart and joy in your soul. Thank you.